I was shipped away to a boarding school when I was 15 because I was an asshole. <laughs> I also had a severe case of Tourette syndrome, which is a neurological disorder that leads to involuntary movements and noises, but mainly it was just a teenage asshole. <laughs> My general snarkiness and unrefined conduct earned me the most attention hours ever in the entire history of my boarding school. Impressive, I know. Now, this was a hippie boarding school in Burlington, Vermont, where we called teachers by their first names and all of our teachers brought their dogs to school. So in addition to detention, because I was rarely sorry for my actions, most of the time, my punishments also involved writing apology letters to whoever I had wronged, like this one to my math tutor. Dear Isaiah, can you just admit that math is boring and pointless? Can you just admit that this is a complete waste of both of our time? I'm sorry I threw my math book against the wall. It was my attempt at throwing it into another dimension so I never had to look at it again. I'm mostly sorry it didn't work. Love, Pammy. A few years ago, I found the letters in a binder in my mother's basement. They had been gifted back to me when I graduated. There are hundreds of them, and not once was I actually sorry. For instance, dear Jeannie, I was not the one who put Sour Patch Kids in your hair. I really wasn't. I know this sounds like something I would do, but it wasn't me. Since I have to write this letter, I guess I'm sorry that I didn't think to put Sour Patch Kids in your hair. It was funny, and since I'm getting punished for it, I might as well get some of the credit too. Sorry I'm not sorry at all, XOXO, Pammy. Uh, a number of letters were written to my headmaster, John, who, believe it or not, I actually adored. Dear John, I was not the one, one of the ones who snuck out. I really wasn't. I have Tourette's. That makes it nearly impossible for me to do anything without making noise. Do you really think they're gonna invite somebody who barks on a secret mission where being silent is of the utmost importance? Use your common sense. If you still wanna punish me for sneaking out, I'll take the punishment because it's clear that your stupidity is punishment enough. <laughs> Sorry, I just called you stupid. Love, Pammy. And a number of letters weren't addressed to people at all. Dear bottom step of the girl's floor staircase, I'm sorry I kicked you. You did nothing wrong to provoke me. The headmaster provoked me, not you. The good news is that you are made of wood and are literally 100 years old. And I didn't even leave a dent. I will not kick you again. And if I do, I will pay for the damage if there is any. I will also high five everyone for kicking you hard enough to leave a dent. Not that sorry, Pam. <laughs> Looking back at all of these letters as an adult, I find it astonishing that I turned out to be a functioning member of society. Although I am a comedian, so that's a little debatable. <laughs> However, tucked in the back of this binder full of letters was a letter I had written unprompted and never turned in. Dear me, you have nothing to be sorry for if you make the choice to not be here anymore but you know better than to make that decision right now. Wait until the end of the year. If you do that and you still feel this way, you have permission to no longer be. I know things are hard, so in a few months, if they're still this hard, you can opt out. Love, Pam. Turns out I was pushing the world away from me as hard as I possibly could so it would be easier to leave. For so many years, my Tourette's had been incredibly severe. We're talking broken bones from the intense, repetitive movements and constant loud noises. Because of the disruptive nature of my Tourette's, the messaging was that I was detrimental to every space I entered. Or maybe even worse, it felt like if I was included, it was only as a good deed. Not because anybody wanted me there, not because they saw any value in me being there. I had internalized this idea that my very presence takes away from the world. Quietly, over time, depression and suicide ideation had taken over my world. I think so many of us in our own ways can relate, right? We are pretending that these things that make our lives harder don't exist, or we're ignoring it or even quietly hating it. I was pushing it all away. The shame of identifying with a disability or mental illness, it felt like too much. It can be scary to name it, to name that you're struggling, because when you do that, it almost makes it real. And you're admitting this is hard, or I need help, or I can't go at it alone. It's so much easier to be mad than scared. 
About one in four adults in the US have some type of disability. And about half of us will be diagnosed with a mental illness in our lifetime. And all of us, all of us have something that makes our life feel messier or, or overwhelming. We always hear these messages to be more inclusive, to celebrate differences, and that's so incredibly important. But it's harder than we acknowledge to internalize it within ourselves, to live it, to feel it. I tour the world talking about inclusion. It's one thing if this world is inclusive. None of that matters if you hate who you are. Back at boarding school, I was sitting in detention and I happened to be the only one there. And the teacher decided to try something new. He took a sheet of paper and he wrote, things Pam loves about herself at the top. And he put it in front of me. Make a list, he said. Like it was yesterday, I remember wanting so badly to have something to put on that list. I remember watching his face turn to fear as he realized I wasn't just being a snarky teenager, I truly had nothing about myself that I loved or that I felt added any value to this world. Thankfully, boarding school jumped into action. They did two things that day. The first thing they did was put me in therapy. Love that for me, right? Yeah, therapy. But they didn't explicitly tell me I was going to therapy. The dean came up to me and he goes, hey, Pammy, tomorrow we're going to Wendy's. And I spent the whole night excited about getting spicy chicken nuggets. Turns out my therapist's name was Wendy. <laughs> therapy started out about as well as you think it would. Dear mom, I'm sorry that I continue to sleep on my therapist's couch instead of talking about my feelings. I didn't know how expensive therapy was, so I'm sorry I wasted your money. I also didn't know that my therapist could tattle on me for taking a snooze during therapy. Feels like a dick move on her part. I'd like a new therapist, one with one of those super comfy down couches. Love, Pammy. <laughs> then my teacher signed me up for a bunch of extracurriculars to see if I could find my thing. One by one, I ruled them out until they put me in a stand-up comedy class. There, the things that had always landed me in detention were welcomed, even encouraged. I was getting laughs, and they weren't laughing at my Tourette's. They were laughing at my point of view. I was completely hooked. After that very first workshop, I went back to that empty list that had been sitting on my desk for weeks of things that I love about myself. I took out a blue marker, and I proudly wrote, sense of humor. My teachers even framed it for me so I could hang it on my dorm room wall. I had found one thing. That's a place I could build from. That's a place we can all build from. At this point in my life, I tour the world combining comedy and storytelling to talk about inclusion and mental health. In doing that, I share my story of learning to embrace what makes me me. For so many years of my life, I hated everything about myself. So often someone will come up to me after a show and they'll ask how I went so quickly from hating Tourette's to loving Tourette's. And the answer is, I didn't. Looking back, I think I was waiting for Tourette's and my obsessive compulsive disorder to like magically go away before I found any love for myself. Almost like a roadblock, right? I needed the hard parts to be less hard before I learned to love any part of me. At first, finding out that I love my sense of humor was not connected to my Tourette's. It always felt like I had two sides, the side with the bad stuff and the side with the good stuff. I have Tourette syndrome, obsessive compulsive disorder, some pretty significant bouts of depression, and I am funny and creative and incredibly resilient. Those first parts, those aren't weaknesses. They are the parts of me that are messier. <laughs> They're the parts of me I'm often working through in therapy, but when I lean into them, they inform my creativity and my passion and my determination. It's not about dealing with one side so we get to enjoy the other. It's about embracing the middle, the intersectionality, getting to the point of realizing they're not two separate identities. Instead, they work together to build us into the amazing, weird, incredible individuals that we are. The important part is the and. I wish as a society we talked more about the work that goes into embracing our and because it can feel really lonely to have a disability or a mental health challenge or to be going through something hard. The journey of finding one thing I love about myself took effort, but effort led to me finding my passion with comedy and comedy taught me more than just how to write a well-timed fart joke, although it did teach me that. It also taught me that these things about me that I love don't exist despite the parts about me that are harder. They're connected. They overlap. None of this is unique to me. You all probably don't have Tourette's syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder, but we all have something.
And when you look at yourself as a full person, we can be honest about the stuff that makes life harder and the stuff that makes you shine. And how even if we can't always see it, they connect and they overlap. So if you're sitting here thinking that's too overwhelming, I don't even know where to start. Start with admitting one thing you love about yourself. And if you don't have it yet, that's okay. Start the journey to find one thing you love about yourself. Ask for help if you need it. There is so much joy in saying, screw it. I'm gonna figure out how to love what makes me me, even if it doesn't always feel like I'm supposed to. A few months ago, my Tourette's had been incredibly severe for an extended amount of time, both painful and noticeable. And one day I decided to do a little, a little self-care, a little retail therapy as one does. So I headed over to Bloomingdale's. As I shopped, I could feel people watching my Tourette's. And still, I found a necklace that I wanted and I got in line to pay. One person in front of me, one person behind me. I got to the front of the line and I watched the sales associate watch my Tourette's. I watched her watch it for an uncomfortable amount of time. And then she looked at the person behind me and she said, is she with you? And I said, no, I'm with me. And then she watched my Tourette's a little bit more and she said, sweetheart, you know the things here cost money, right? I put the necklace down and I walked out sobbing, immediately feeling like 15-year-old me again. It was only later as I pictured burning down Bloomingdale's, metaphorically, of course, <laughs> that I wish I had had my pretty woman moment, you know what I mean? And been like, do you work on commission? Big mistake, huge. But here's the thing. The world isn't always so kind. As a 15-year-old writing those apology letters, yeah, I was hard on me, but also the world was hard on me. That's not all on me, I can be honest about that. I'd internalize the way the world often treats people with disabilities and mental health challenges. If I had not chosen to love myself, to work on myself, to embrace myself, it's moments like that that would break me. But I'm not gonna let them. Because I found my passion, my thing, moments like that hurt, yes, but they also allow me to connect with audiences like you. I survive those moments because I intentionally move into my and. Finding one thing I love about myself started my journey to live in my and, to plant my feet right there in the middle. For me, sometimes it's asking for help. Sometimes it's watching hours of Brene Brown. Sometimes it's getting a master's in advocacy and realizing that was expensive therapy. I did that. <laughs> but it always means putting in some work to remind myself that all of the parts of me can add incredible things to my life if I'm brave enough to allow it. What does it mean for you? I still have that framed list of the very first thing I love about myself hanging in my apartment. It's moved with me to every place I've lived ever since high school. Sometimes I close my eyes and picture myself meeting 15-year-old me with my unbrushed hair and unbrushed teeth. <laughs> I wish I could hug her and thank her for starting the work. I'm so glad she decided to stay. 15-year-old Pam had no idea that she held 36-year-old Pam's life in her hands. I'm glad she didn't know. That's a lot of pressure. But 15-year-old Pam realized she was worth the effort. So when things are hard and I am struggling, I remind myself that I hold future versions of me in my hands. And I wanna get to meet those versions. So I continue putting in the effort. I joke with my family and friends uh, that sometimes I secretly miss all of that detention and all of those apology letters. So I guess here's one more. Dear TEDx audience, as a 15-year-old asshole at Weird Kid Boarding School, I would have made fun of all of this. I would have called me lame and you all losers for being here on a weekend. <laughs> and still, I learned to love the messy parts of myself. And I embrace the fact that some of me will always be messy. I hope you leave here today living a little bit more in your and, because that will bring more joy and purpose into your life than you can imagine. I have Tourette syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder, and I am funny and creative and resilient and wildly inappropriate, and also still an asshole. And I'm not that sorry. Love, Pammy. Thank you.